This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our armed forces, particularly those of you serving in the Middle East who are joining us over the Internet today, and also new listeners tuning in from Texas, North Carolina, New York, Ohio, Florida, Arizona, and from every state in the Union. Thank you for making us part of your news week. In just a moment, one of our greatest constitutional lawyers, Mr. Alan Dershowitz, will be joining us to talk about why the two leading presidential candidates have caused many voters to feel disappointed and frustrated. And he's also going to help us figure out what the legal ramifications are of FBI Director Comey's investigation into the newly discovered Clinton emails might be. The name of Dershowitz's latest book is... Electile Dysfunction, a guide for unaroused voters. And if you're a regular listener of the Costa Report, well, then you already know that I am one of those unaroused voters. But before Mr. Dershowitz joins the program, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. Alan Morton Dershowitz was born in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Brooklyn, and is a graduate of Brooklyn College and Yale Law School. After being admitted to the bar, he clerked for U.S. Court of Appeals Judge for the District of Columbia, David Bazelon, and Supreme Court Associate Justice Arthur Goldberg. In 1964, Dershowitz joined the faculty of Harvard Law School and just three short years later became the youngest full professor in the school's history. While you may know Dershowitz for his high-profile cases, which include the defense for Klaus von Bülow, Patricia Hearst, Mike Tyson, Jim Baker, Leona Hemsley, O.J. Simpson, Michael Milken, and the list goes on. He is also inarguably one of our country's most knowledgeable scholars when it comes to constitutional law and U.S. foreign policy. He has been the recipient of countless awards, including the William O. Douglas First Amendment Award and is a prolific best-selling author, and today we're going to hear about his latest offering. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report one of our country's foremost constitutional authorities, Mr. Alan Dershowitz. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Dershowitz. Hey, thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Well, congratulations on your latest book, Electile Dysfunction, A Guide for Unaroused Voters, and as you know, I am one of those unaroused voters, and I realize I've only got a few days to make up my mind, so (laughs) I'm interested to know uh, what it is about this particular election that you find the most dysfunctional. Well, everybody hates both candidates. Uh, Almost everybody is going to vote against the candidate rather than in favor of a candidate. There's never been an election where votes are going to be so negative. And, you know, when I wrote my book, I was really uh, focusing on the electoral system. That's why I called it electoral dysfunction. But now we also see uh, dysfunction in our law enforcement, in our FBI, in our Justice Department. We're seeing leaks that are unlawful, FBI agents that are leaking material about ongoing investigation, which is a crime. We're seeing uh, all kinds of problems with the attempt on both sides to criminalize conduct, which is just uh, politics as usual. And uh, we're seeing the merger of criminal justice and, um, and electoral politics. It's very, very, very unhealthy. We're seeing, you know, one candidate suggesting maybe he won't accept the result of the election if he loses. We're seeing another candidate who is accused of destroying uh, evidence that was subpoenaed by Congress. Uh, It's just unbelievable how dysfunctional this current election has shown our system to be. So the dysfunctionality that you started with, right, which was Mm -hmm. the electoral college process and the process Mm -hmm. of nominating these candidates, that turned out to be just the tip of the iceberg. That's right. It was really just the tip of the iceberg. It was a pretty large tip of a very deep iceberg. I mean, the, the result was that we got a populist uh, candidate, 
uh, who uh, has very, very high negatives uh, without much experience in government. Donald Trump, who turns out to be a very effective campaigner, getting lots and lots of people to support him. And then we get a candidate who's kind of an establishment candidate who has a, you know, a long history that many people are very upset about. In fact, in the last pages of my book, I said that, and this was written essentially in August, while she was way ahead. And I wrote that you can't predict the outcome of this election for four reasons, uh, even no matter what the polls show. And the first reason is that when you have a populist election with a lot of emotion, whether it be Brexit in London or whether it be the vote for FARC in South America about making peace with the rebels, the polls are always wrong. They always underpredict the performance of popular causes or popular. Second, you never know what Donald Trump's going to do in the future. And, of course, he made my prediction come true. He did so many things, said so many outrageous things. Third, you can't know what Hillary Clinton has done in the past. And that came true, too. Look at what's come out. And we now have, you know, Comey looking at more uh, emails. And, and finally, voter turnout. You can never predict voter turnout. And it looks like there's going to be lower voter turnout among young black voters and in other segments of the population. So anybody who thinks they can predict the outcome of this election uh, is, is fooling themselves and fooling the people that they are telling they can pick the outcome of the election. The New York Times still has her 85 to 15 percent in terms of betting odds winning this election. You know, anybody who wants to make that bet with me, I'll take the the five to one or six to one odds. That just is not a good bet today. You can't know today what's going to happen on Tuesday. But I want to go backward in time. I mean, there's something wrong with the primary process that has produced these two candidates. I think that's right. Uh, first of all, the primary process tends to do two things. One, when there is no incumbent, it tends to push the process toward extremes. When you have 15 people running for president like the Republicans did, and one who is a populist, he's going to likely shine among, among the 15. Uh, and when you have an establishment uh, uh, candidate and only running against one populist like, like Sanders, it's likely to have the opposite result. Also, you have a situation where... Um, you know, people vote on different days and different times um, for the president in the primaries. Small states, which have no impact on the ultimate electoral college, get to have far, far too much influence, and it pushes the process toward extremes. Uh, it, it gets the nominating process to move away from the center and toward extremes. And I'm very worried about the growth of extremism, not only in the United States, but around the world. We're seeing more and more, the left is becoming the extreme, extreme hard left, and the right's becoming the extreme, extreme hard right. And the center, the vibrant center, the old debates we used to have between classic liberals and classic conservatives is being left in the trash bin of history. And the debates now are between the extreme left and the extreme right. That's worse in many parts of the world, but it looks like in this election, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty bad, not only on election day, but after Election Day as well. I don't think we're going to see um, a minimization of the extremism. And then I think after Election Day also, people are going to think hard about whether our Justice Department and FBI are functioning properly or whether we need some reform there as well. Well, I think certainly the two parties have to take a hard look because Trump has disrupted the GOP in a way that no one expected. But now we've got this information that Hillary Clinton had debate questions uh, during the primaries. And, and out, this is out, not arguable. No, and it's outrageous. And, uh, and, I, and I, you know, and I have to wonder how Bernie Sanders feels going out and stumping for Clinton right now. <laughs> well, or Ted Cruz uh, going out and, and stumping <laughs> for, for Donald Trump after Ted Cruz insulted his father, insulted his wife, insulted him. Uh, I, I feel like I'm he... watching an episode of the Fire Sign Theater. Uh, right, probably right. there's a lot of people that don't remember them, but they oh, had this just. <laughs> you, you, you remember those guys, and they used to come up with these scenarios, and and nobody thought that they'd ever come true. But you know, well, here, we, here are. we are. Now yeah. we have to take our first break, but sure. stay right where you are. We'll be right back with more from Alan Dershowitz. You're listening to the Costa Report.
Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature. But human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand, and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. holiday season is just around the corner and I want to share one of my favorite tips for being able to avoid that last minute dash to buy something that screams, I didn't put much thought into this. Now imagine a different scenario this year. Imagine the surprise on your loved one's face when they open the first page of the Watchman's Rattle and see a custom dedication in their name by the author. The best part is it's so easy. Just go to RebeccaCosta.com, do it right now, and click on the book cover and presto. In less than three minutes, you can request the inscription you want. So do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com, and this year, give an affordable, thoughtful gift that says, this is for you and only you. That's RebeccaCosta.com. All across Monterey County, neighbors are coming together to urge a strong no vote on the deceptive Measure Z. Neighbors like Jeannie Byrne, the chair of the Monterey Water Management District. We have been producing oil safely since 1947 without impacting our water supply. And farmers and ranchers are speaking out against Measure Z, like Greg Trainer, owner of 43 Ranch Olive Oil in San Ardo. Measure Z would cost $280 million each year in lost economic output. That would mean the loss of nearly 1,000 local jobs, and with it, millions in local property taxes, devastating our fire, police, and school funding. That's why the Monterey Herald said, voters need to look past this obvious attempt to mislead the public and vote no on Measure Z, or take it from retired Colonel Terry Baer. Monterey County can't afford Measure Z. Paid for by No One Z. Stop the oil and gas shutdown. Major funding by Air Energy LLC and Chevron Corporation. Unexpected reactions to smart financial decisions brought to you by FeedThePig.org. Well, I finally did it. I opened a 401k. So you're giving up. Just like that. Giving up on what? On getting an inheritance from a distant relative. Don't you think if there were a billionaire in the family, we'd know about it by now? Listen to me. We are one phone call away from riding horses on our own private polo grounds. One call from christening yachts, having a butler using summer as a verb. How do you figure? Look, everyone's got a rich uncle somewhere. It's statistics. So the best thing you can do is just prepare for the inevitable. Right, which is why I thought maybe it would be smart to take control of my finances. You know, start using a budget, get out of debt, set some retirement goals. Budgets? Debt? You watch your mouth. Retirement shouldn't be a goal for us. It should be a way of life. When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of CPAs and the Ad Council. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is legal expert and author of the new best-selling book, Electile Dysfunction, Mr. Alan Dershowitz. And we've been talking about just how deep and wide the dysfunction of not only the election has been, but also judicial oversight. Now, in a recent article, you claim the polling data is likely to be just as wrong uh, in this election as the polling trends prior to the Brexit vote. But wasn't that primarily due to voter turnout? It was partly due. The young people didn't come out. It rained that day. What's new? It rained in London. 
But um, I think there were other problems as well, and that is polls underpredict certain kinds of candidates or issues. For example, a poll was done in the United States. On the same day, they asked the same voters who they would vote for, Clinton or, or Trump. And when they were asked by a live person, more of them said Clinton. And when they were asked by a machine, uh, more of them said Trump. So there is the embarrassment vote, people who are embarrassed to tell people that they're going to vote for Trump. But in practice, when they go into the uh, voting booth alone, they will vote for Trump. So if Trump is behind by two points or less uh, in polls uh, on the day of the election, I think he may very well win the election. I have had so many people uh, email me or come up to me and privately say, I don't want to say I'm voting for Trump because I don't want to get into a fight, yeah. an argument. Uh, I agree with that. I spoke just today uh, at a group of people, conservative people, and I got the sense that many more of them would vote for Trump than would admit they were voting for Trump. So I think there's a hidden vote for Trump. We've seen that phenomenon in other contexts as well. When David Dinkins ran for mayor of New York, who was an African-American, uh, many more people voted against him, probably because he was African-American, than were willing to admit doing that in the polls. That didn't happen so much with, uh, with uh, Barack Obama when he ran for president. So maybe the racial phenomenon is getting less. But I think the embarrassment for voting for Trump phenomenon will show that at least in many places, many parts of the country, uh, there will be more votes for Trump than the poll show. More likely in places like New York and California than in the Midwest. I mean, in the Midwest, there are a lot of houses that have big Trump signs on them. You don't find them in New York and California. Mm -hmm. Now, you've pointed out that this is an unpredictable election for a lot of reasons, one of them being Trump is himself unpredictable. Right. Uh, but let's talk about the future outcome of these email investigations that are mm -hmm. underway and now the Clinton Foundation investigation, which is a separate investigation. Right. This has th thrown a whole new unpredictability into this. Do you feel Comey did the right thing to inform Congress of the newly discovered emails on Wiener's computer? Not in the way he did it. What he should have said is, look, um, I told you that if we found new information, we would continue to look at them. We found new information. We're looking at them, but we don't know what's in them. The Fourth Amendment prohibits us from looking at them until we have a warrant. We don't have a warrant yet. So we don't know any more about what's on the emails than you do. For all we know, they may be duplicates of previous emails or emails only regarding personal matters, not governmental matters. So you shouldn't infer anything from what I've said about any possible guilt or innocence of Hillary Clinton. If he was going to say something, he should have reassured the voter that he doesn't know anything about the content. But the way he did it, talking about them being pertinent and kind of suggesting he was reopening the investigation, allowed Donald Trump to say, aha, there must be something really, really bad in these emails. Otherwise, he wouldn't have written the letter he did to Congress. So he misinformed Congress. And I think the reason he did it is he thought at that time that Hillary Clinton was so far ahead that she was likely to get a win no matter what. And then he didn't want to be faulted for having kept secret something that might affect some voters. But now we see the opposite possibility. He may have affected the election against Hillary Clinton. She may lose as the result of what he said. And then after investigation, he may turn up nothing. He may conclude that these are just duplicates. So, uh, you know, he, he, he was torn uh, between, you know, two very, very bad options. And the reason for that is because he had spoken out in July. He should never have done that. He just should have said the investigation is closed. But now, how do we know about the Clinton Foundation investigation leaks from FBI agents? Those leaks are crimes. It is illegal to leak ongoing investigations. I know because as a criminal lawyer, when my client is being investigated, I would give my right arm to find out what the nature of the investigation is, but I can't find it out because it's against the law for the FBI to reveal it. And I think what Comey is doing is he, he confused himself with the play-by-play -play announcer for the Chicago uh, Cubs in the World <laughs> Series. Oh, now the score is tied. Now Cleveland looks like they're coming back. You don't do that. Play-by-play -play is for baseball. It's not for ongoing FBI investigations. I understand that. But, you know, Comey, to me, was in a no-win situation. He if he waited sure. to notify Congress, he would have been aiding the Clinton campaign. And by coming forward... Forward, there's no question that he's, uh, you know, uh, cast doubt. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I, you got to feel for the guy. And I understand that he should have been clear about the fact that there is no evidence one way or another that these emails yeah. are pertinent, but they have to be investigated. I understand that. But we now have a separate investigation uh, uh, regarding the Clinton Foundation 
Now so both of that. those are going on in parallel. Right, but we only know that because of leaks. And I have to tell you, I'll make a prediction. I'm going to go out on a limb. Where are these leaks coming from? The FBI. We know that. We know there are some rogue FBI agents. Are you sure it's very... not Donna Brazil? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I think that we, ha- we know we have some rogue FBI agents, probably who are strong Trump supporters. There were probably some people in the Justice Department who were strong Hillary Clinton supporters. So we have that going in both directions. And that's yeah. just not the way our justice system should operate. I have a prediction. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Okay. And, and come back to me and tell me I'm wrong if it doesn't happen. I think within a couple of weeks after the election, no matter who wins, a Comey is going to resign. He's going to say, look, this has become too much about me, uh, whether I was right or wrong, and I think I was right. I have put the FBI into a difficult, awkward position, and so I'm now going to resign and let somebody else take over but, the but FBI. But let's be honest here. The only reason it's a difficult position is timing, isn't it? It's of not course. what oh. was done necessarily, but it's the timing of it, isn't it? It's, and that's why there's a, a rule in the Justice Department not to release material about an investigation 60 mm-hmm. days before an election to avoid this kind of timing. But in general, nobody should be talking. Uh, first of all, the FBI director should never be talking. It should always be the attorney general who says the investigation's closed. Uh, she is his boss. He works for her. Uh, but because Bill Clinton foolishly got on the airplane with Loretta Lynch, she had to uh, recuse herself from the case, and that's why um, Comey got uh, so much more influence than FBI directors in the past have had. You know, we all trust Comey. He's a good guy. But let's remember who the building he works in is named after, J. Edgar Hoover, who was not a good guy. And whatever <laughs> precedent he establishes could be used by a bad FBI director in the future. So we have to be cautious and careful about what we let the director of the FBI do. So what happens after the election? Let's assume the FBI finds something. Uh, do they bring a, a, an indictment against the president? They do. They do. They let the chips fall where they may. They let uh, the uh, evidence point in the direction it should point in. Then, of course, uh, we have the great constitutional issue, can a president pardon herself? I think the answer to that is no. The Constitution doesn't say a president can pardon themselves. But legal ethics say you can't be a judge in your own case. And I think if she were to pardon herself while president, I think she would be subject to impeachment, much like when Richard Nixon tried to stop the investigation of him by firing Archibald Cox. He was legitimately subject to, uh, to uh, impeachment. Mm-hmm. Now, we have to take another short break, but we'll return. And we're going to find out why voter turnout also makes this election very unpredictable. You're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, recent winners of the best sparkling wine in the U.S. in the Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championship. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. So what is it about your Brut Cuvée that beat all the other competitors around the world? We really focus on creating an expression of the Santa Lucia Highlands and doing it the right way. And when you control the process from the beginning to the end and you have talent like Michelle and top-tier grapes, they really shine through. This was a worldwide competition. It was definitely a humbling experience. We were in a room with producers that have been making wine for over 100, 200 years and was a huge honor to have Tom Stevenson give us the best U.S. Sparkling Wine Award. We fared really well overall. We had three wines win best of class, which was great. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea, or find us online at caracciolicellars.com, or reach us by phone, 831-622-7722. Hiring people is probably the worst part of my job. We started using ZipRecruiter about three months ago. One click and my job was posted to 100 plus job boards, all the top sites. All of the candidates came to my dashboard and it's easy to compare them. And I couldn't believe the number of great applicants we got. I don't know how we hired before ZipRecruiter. Find the best candidates with ZipRecruiter, where your job is just one click away from 100 plus job sites. And right now you can try ZipRecruiter free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash radio offer. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash radio offer. When Dad needed help getting around, I became his driver. Soon enough, it was up to me to be his housekeeper and financial manager, too. When he moved in, I became his cook and even his nurse. But no matter what roles I play, I know I'm still his daughter. 
we understand the roles you play. So to help, we created aarp.org slash caregiving, where you can connect with experts and other caregivers. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Hi, registered pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years. And what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. The ocean surface is coated with cells and living things. We call that stuff plankton. It comes in three varieties, animal, bacterial, and plant. Plant plankton are composed of ancient microscopic entities called algae. In addition to being among the most abundant substances on Earth, seaweeds are among the planet's most nutritionally dense edibles. And because these seaweed or plant plankton have to access and metabolize and in essence work in and with ultraviolet radiation, they are packed with sunlight processing and protection chemicals like pigments and antioxidants. Their ability to store solar energy makes them an ideal nutriment source for the animals that subsist on them. And there's not a single ocean critter whose health does not depend in some way on the ability of plankton to utilize, store, and make available sunshine and energy. These living entities, plankton, are chock full of every single essential nutrient an animal needs, whether that animal is an octopus, a bear, or a human being, including amino acids, all the vitamins, essential fatty acids, and absorbable plant minerals. This makes plankton and algae the ultimate superfood. If you want to take advantage of algae's nutrient density, you can find it in health food stores and on the Internet in the form of nutritional supplements, powders, and liquids. You can also find various dried seaweeds in an Asian market. Try adding some to salads for a nutrient-dense crunch to improve their flavor and nutritional value. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos, too, at kscohealth.com. That's k scohealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and if you're just joining us, my guest today is Alan Dershowitz, whose new book, Electile Dysfunction, lays out the reasons so many of us are troubled by the current election and the many issues which have come forth. So let's talk about the Electoral College. If you're right about the number of Trump voters that the polls are not reflecting, what happens if Clinton takes the Electoral College vote, but Trump wins the overwhelming popular vote? Well, of course, that's happened a few times in our history. Uh, The first time it happened was when Andrew Jackson overwhelmingly beat John Quincy Adams, and the electors decided that he was too much of a populist, and they uh, turned it over to the House of Representatives, which gave the election to John Quincy Adams. Of course, it happened in 2000. I wrote a book about it called Supreme Injustice. Uh, where Gore won the popular vote narrowly, but uh, won it. And then, of course, uh, Bush won the electoral vote when Florida was turned over to him. That's possible in in this case as well, because uh, Trump will win overwhelmingly in some states, and there will be a close vote in, in other states. Um, and, you know, if if, uh, if Hillary Clinton wins the electoral vote and Trump wins the popular vote, uh, Trump will complain, but in the end he'll have to accept the election. Uh, if the opposite happens, it's unlikely, but if the opposite happens, if Hillary Clinton wins the popular vote and Trump wins the electoral vote, there'll be no complaint. It'll just be business as usual. She'll, she'll accept the election. So, um, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see that problem. But we could have uh, we could have another Bush versus Gore. We could have another uh, evening where everything turns on one state. Could be North Carolina this time. Could be Florida again. It could be Virginia. It could be Pennsylvania. Any of those states could be key uh, battleground states when it comes to deciding who wins the electoral college. So you know, stay tuned. It can be a long, long night on uh, uh, next Tuesday. The other well, thing I the, think this if will... the polls are wrong, then you're yeah. pro- then there are probably more states that are swing states and right. going to be contested yeah. than we even realize. I, I think that's right. I think it's right. I think there'll be more swing states, and I think there'll be more heavily contested states. And, um, you know, it could be a lot, lot closer. And there could be some surprise states. There could be states in where uh, Hillary Clinton's way ahead by, you know, five or six points that may end up being in Trump's column. And that's why I think in the last days 
he was campaigning in states that everybody thought were clearly Democratic states because he thinks he has a shot at perhaps turning those states uh, into uh, Republican states. Look, it's going to be very, very difficult to predict the outcome of this election until the votes are cast. And of course, millions of votes have already been cast. And it's made me rethink the idea of early voting, because I think a lot of people voted and are unhappy that they voted and would like to take back their vote. In fact, Trump, in a recent campaign appearance, urged people to take back their vote. You can do that in some states. By showing up on Election Day and actually casting a vote, you can cancel your previous absentee ballot. Now, I've already voted myself. I have no interest in canceling my ballot, but some people might do that. I think we have to rethink this idea of people having two months to vote, because people end up voting then on the basis of very different uh, states of facts. And if something really dramatic had come up, I don't think that these new emails fill that uh, void but, or description. But if something really dramatic came up for either candidate and, and a lot of people had already voted, I, I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. So if I had to build a democratic system, I think I might say voting over two or three day period, but not a, a, a two month period. And maybe no, maybe no a campaigning during that two or three day period. I think the current situation gives rise to the possibility of very, very dissatisfied voters. I agree with you. I think the the early voting period is way too early. And, and yeah. if anything, this election has proven that point. New yeah. facts have come up. Uh, mm-hmm. It would be like letting the jury vote before the uh, case was, you know, closed That's up. That's a very good analogy. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. I will borrow it with attribution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no attribution needed. You know, in your book, Electile Dysfunction, you remind us that 75 percent of Americans believe the government's corrupt. 62 yeah. percent feel the country on the wrong track. 34% think the election is rigged. Yet these government officials were elected by Americans to represent them. Sure. So, so help me sure. understand, how is it possible, right, that the very people we elected, we say are corrupt and rigging the system? Uh, I, I mean, don't doesn't that responsibility fall back on the voter? Sure. But, you know, just think about when you go down ballot, how many people you vote for, that you have no idea who they are. Uh, my grandmother, you know, she was very easy for my grandmother. She'd go down a list. If she saw a Jewish name, she'd vote for it. If she didn't, <laughs> she wouldn't. I, I don't vote that way. You know, I think there are some people who say if they see a woman's name, they'll vote for it. If they see a name that suggests that the person is Latino or African-American, they'll vote for it. But when you vote for, uh, you know, the, 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 the secretary of state or the register of voters, you don't know what you're voting for in many cases. And so um, people then say, uh, look, the, the, there's, there's a rigging. I don't think we have rigged elections in this country. I do think we've had some in the past. Uh, if you read the biography of Lyndon Johnson, uh, certainly he distorted the electoral process uh, several times when he was running. I used to call him landslide Lyndon because Lyndon, he won his Senate seat by you know a few hundred votes, and there was grave questions about that, the 1960 election, whether or not Kennedy actually won in, uh, in Illinois uh, was very much open to doubt, but Nixon ultimately accepted uh, the results. And, you know, it would be interesting to see what happens here. You know, you mentioned my book, Electile Dysfunction. It's interesting it, that what you can do now, it's an e-book, and I actually wrote it in August uh, in three weeks. It's a short book in three weeks. And, uh, uh, okay, you I don't got... have to make me jealous just because I take six years to get <laughs> no, a book no, out. You're, you're shaming too. me. You're <laughs> shaming too, me right one. now. <laughs> not this one, but it's an ebook, so you just click a click a, a button and you get it uh, online. I mean, the disadvantages of an ebook is you can't go to the store and 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 read it. You can buy it in hardcover, but it has to be shipped to you because you know that's the nature of the way publishing is becoming, and everything is so instant. I write columns now. I finish it by three in the afternoon, and by 4.30, it's online. So instantaneous communication has become a very important part of the electoral process. And I will tell you that even though uh, there are many people that are listening that are pretty sure how they're going to vote uh, in, in just a few days, 
Uh, there are a lot of people that feel ambivalent, and I'm going to recommend that they read this book, Electile Dysfunction. You can get it as an ebook. It's very easy to read. You're such a terrific writer, and it's very <laughs> easy to read. You'll bree- breeze through it in one night, and uh, and I think people should read this before they cast their votes. I, I do. Well, <laughs> Just like we were talking about they should not vote early. I don't think they should They should vote until they really look at how the, what this election really means. No, I agree with you. I think that uh, a lot of people are voting because they don't like one of the candidates. Yeah, they're using it as a blocking mechanism. Right. And in my book, I have a series of uh, issues that I think everybody should check off on their own list. I don't tell people who to vote for. I don't hide who I'm voting for, but I don't tell people who to vote for. I just say, here are the 10 or so issues that are probably important to you. And if you come out this way in this issue, maybe you should vote for Trump. If you come out this way in this issue, maybe you should vote for Hillary Clinton. For example, the Supreme Court. That's such a clear difference. Hillary Clinton has said she would appoint more justices like Justice Sotomayor, like Justice Kagan. Uh, and, and, of course, Trump has said he would like, if he could, nine Scalia's on the court. Now, you know, Justice Scalia was a friend of mine. I, I knew him very well. I don't think I even that. he would want nine Scalia's on the court. He might want three or four, but not nine. Uh, the idea uh, so. that there'd even be two. Uh-huh. Well, there'll, nev- <laughs> there'll is, is never be another Justice Scalia. He was unique. And I always enjoyed being with him. And uh, he came to my class once, and we had a ferocious debate. We had a ferocious debate once in Israel. We were both there together. And, um, you know, in my book, uh, Supreme Injustice, that I wrote in 2000, I really uh, really go after him for Bush versus Gore. But we remained good friends. And uh, he was a great justice. And important to have one Justice Scalia on the court, but perhaps not nine. Yes, well, I don't think that we we have to worry about even being able to find nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has nine children, so uh, oh, goodness. you never know. And one of uh, the, several of them, at least one of them is a lawyer. <laughs> we have to take our final intermission. We'll be right back following these messages from today's sponsors. You're listening to the Costa Report. Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, big data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. In the opening of All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remark wrote, This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will simply try to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. Today, Project Healing Waters offers men and women that have escaped the shells of war the opportunity to heal by teaching our returning veterans to fly fish in some of the most beautiful, tranquil rivers in our country. These natural surroundings have the ability to restore the human spirit, and with your help, Project Healing Waters is able to reach out to thousands of our men and women in the military every year. For information on how you can help, go to projecthealingwaters.org. Please give and give generously to those who have put their lives on the line for you. That's projecthealingwaters.org. Help those who have escaped the shells of war and need your help to come all the way back. Psst, Billy. What? Can you keep a secret? Sometimes. Guess what? What? Michael's whirling is turning 65. Are we going to have a party? 
Yes, but don't tell anybody. Well, that might be a little difficult on a 10,000-watt radio station. Well, anyway, it's on Friday. It's at noon. It's here at KSCO. We're having lunch. We're having libations. We're having karaoke. Are we having cake? We're having cake. All right. And we're celebrating Michael's birthday, so... But we're not supposed to tell anybody? Well, I would like the listeners to come, but if we can't tell them, then they won't come. But I would like them to come and wish Michael happy birthday. All right, so come, beginning at noon. I'm going to be here. No, no, I meant to the listeners. Oh, yes, and them too. But don't tell the boss. It's a secret, remember? No, don't tell him because it's a surprise. Okay. All right, good. All right. (laughs) It's me, your heart. High blood pressure is serious, and if you think I'm just going to keep ticking away, you're wrong. I can quit whenever I want, but I like my job. Just treat me better. Maybe we can do some exercise on occasion? After all, we're in this together. Don't let your heart quit on you. High blood pressure can lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. Find out how at heart.org slash blood pressure. A message from the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. Join me, Ruth Copland, on Saturday evening, 8 till 9, for It's a Question of Balance, the show where we balance the intellectual with the creative, featuring thought-provoking conversations. Out and about with people on the street on different topics and in the studio with inspiring local, national and international guests from the arts. Discussion and creativity, two of the most vital ways we engage with the world. I look forward to you joining me, Ruth Copland, 8 to 9, Saturday evening on KSCO. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is Alan Dershowitz, whose new book, Electile Dysfunction, is creating quite a stir, and it is e- available as an ebook. And so there is time to get uh, a copy of it, read it, um, particularly if you'd like a way to frame up your decision and your vote. And who doesn't need help this election? Yeah, and speaking of this election, more than any other, it speaks to adding a none of the above option. Uh, just explain to listeners how how that work. If a none of, if none of the candidates receive more votes than none of the above, the election would become null and void, and a new shorter, say, sixty ninety day election would start where new candidates could enter the race. And while the new election was being held, the Speaker of the House would assume the responsibilities of the president. So, what do you think? Mr. Dershowitz, is it time to add a none of the above option? Well, uh, you know, America has traditionally been a two party country, um, and I think Americans are used to voting Republican, Democrat. Often there is a, a none of the above in effect. I mean, uh, Johnson or Jill Stein are none of the above, but there is no explicit none of the above. And uh, nobody knows for sure what would actually happen if an enormous number of votes went that way. We do know this. If neither candidate gets 270 electoral votes, it immediately goes to the House of Representatives where there's a very strange election. Every state gets just one vote so that Wyoming has as much power to elect the president as California, Florida, New York, or Texas. And um, it's only happened a couple of times in our history. Could that happen? But- could happen. It could, could happen. That, could there that is. happen? Could there be states that just, uh, you know, split their electoral votes? It ties, or uh, they just refrain. Yes, and they don't give one electoral two... votes to either candidate. Could it happen? Right, and, right. Yes, there are still a couple of states that give some discretion to electors. You know, we don't think about there being actual electors, but you know, you vote. Your actual vote for president is not for president. It's, it's you vote for electors. They're not even named on the ballot in the old days. The electors' names used to be on the ballot, and you would check off the names of the electors. And these people, the Electoral College, really met and really had debates and really decided who was going to be the president of the United States. Because remember, we did not create a democracy. It was a republic, not a democracy. And in a republic, you can have some degree of elitism. And the elitism included these great sage people called electors who would decide who would be the best president. Remember, the original Senate was not voted on by the popular 
people. It was picked by the state legislatures. So, you know, we had a very, very strange democracy in the uh, in the in the election where Andrew Jackson uh, won and got more votes than John Quincy Adams. The total number of people voting in that election were 150,000 out of a population of 10 million in America, because, of course, in order to vote, you had to be white, a male, a property owner, um, and uh, a Christian in some states. And so a very small number of people actually were eligible to vote in early America. That changed, obviously, and now everybody who's a citizen has the right to vote. But turnout is still lower in America than in many, many other countries in the world. But but let me ask you this. Is there any doubt in your mind, because there really isn't in mine, but you know, is there any doubt in your mind that if we had a none-of-the-above option, that neither candidate would be able to beat that this election? I think there's a good chance that that would happen. I think that... Is there anything constitutionally to keep us from adding that to every government ballot and saying, look, if you can't even beat none of the above, you don't have the confidence (laughs) of the American people? Well, that certainly would be possible in some state elections. I don't know. You've asked me. You've you've stumped the expert. You've asked the constitutional lawyer. Wow! Wow! I stumped or not, Alan Dershowitz. Can we can we did. constitutionally do that? Because fa- frankly, yeah, frankly, we have a succession plan. The Speaker of the House could take over for a you know kind of a sudden death election. Yeah, no, it's, it's I don't think we should be electing anybody that can't beat none of the above. Yeah, no, that's that's probably the case. And uh, you, you ought to, you know, you ought to get Congress to see whether they can enact something like that. It would be very interesting. And there's never been an election where I think more people would vote for none of the above if that were an available option. Oh, I so, don't have any question yeah, that people yeah. would vote for none of the above, and they would. And and it it offers an opportunity. What I like about it is, number one, you can't make the excuse that your vote doesn't count. Yeah. Right, yeah, because no, you are true. expressing your, your true feelings, and you're yeah. not forced to to lose your vote to a third-party candidate where it's not going to do any good. If none, yeah. if You can do good by voting none of the above. Yeah. And, you know, the subtitle of my book is A Guide for Unaroused Voters. There'd be a lot of aroused voters arousedly voting for none of the above, because I think a lot of people that I know would prefer to cast a vote not for either of them, but they don't want to vote for Jill Stein who really is a, a fanatic, or for, um, you know, for Gary Johnson. Johnson, who doesn't know where Aleppo is uh, uh, and can't uh, name I, I a foreign agree. leader. So I agree, I but, you know, and none of the above expresses the will of the American people. Right. It says we don't want these candidates. Right, and you know, none of the ex- above has no investigations going about them. None of the above has never said, made a racist statement or commented about groping women. So, you know, none of the above is a pretty darn good candidate compared to some of the others who are now running. Yeah, uh, none of the above would get my vote this year. <laughs> I, I, I just, I have to go on record as, as, as say that and say that. Uh, but, you know, it's going to take someone like you, Mr. Dershowitz, to make mm-hmm. that happen. Someone who really knows the Constitution uh-huh. and how to make that happen. Well, I will hey, look what, it what, up. what's the downside? What's the downside? How could there even be a downside? No, I think in a true democracy, you should be able to say you are expressing displeasure at the options that have been presented to you, and that's the way to do it. It makes a lot of sense. I'd have to no, think I hard hear about a court what it case would do coming. to our system. Uh-huh. I hear a court case <laughs> yeah, coming. Yeah, yeah. So give us a little preview in the time that we have left. What happens on November 9th if Trump wins the election? Well, you know, hopefully he behaves himself and he starts being presidential. I've met Trump a couple of times, and he never impressed me as being the kind of person he's, he, he looked like he was during the early part of this election. He seemed to me like a, a decent, straightforward uh, business person, but we've learned a lot since that time. So it's unpredictable, and I think one of the reasons that virtually every world leader, conservative or liberal, doesn't want Trump is because they want predictability. They want to be able to get up every morning and know what's going to happen. And the one thing about Hillary Clinton, she is predictable. We have a 35-year history that will clearly tell us uh, what kind of a president she will be and what she will do. And Um, how about if Clinton wins, what happens uh, on the 9th? I think business as usual. It's a continuation of the Obama administration, more or less. 
there are a few changes. I think we're going to see some tension between Clinton and Obama if that happens. Obama is going to try to take the Israel issue and send it to the U.N. Hillary Clinton will probably be opposed to that. Obama will try to get Merrick Garland put on the Supreme Court. We don't know what uh, view Hillary Clinton will take of that. So there will be some tensions. There's always yeah. tensions between the president-elect and the outgoing lame duck president. But the outgoing lame duck president should not tie the hands of the incoming president. And that's why I'm opposed to uh, Obama sending the Israel matter to the United Nations, which would make peace far more difficult. Yes, I agree with that. The name of the book is Electile Dysfunction, A Guide for the Unaroused Voter, and it is a book for anyone and everyone who's interested in understanding why this election is unlike any other. And we are all out of time, but before we say goodbye, uh-huh. let me thank you for making time to be with us today. Thank you, Mr. Dershowitz, and oh, congratulations you. on your absolute, book. Absolute pleasure to be on with you. Thank you. If your station is leaving us after the first hour and you have a question or comment to make about our interview with Alan Dershowitz, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Has the era of centrist politics come to an end? Is there any place for moderates in the government anymore? And more importantly, would you be in favor of a none-of-the-above option on all government ballots? Send me your comments. Uh, You can send me the comments on our contact page at RebeccaCosta.com. And if you missed the full interview with Alan Dershowitz, you can download any of our previous episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube channel. And if you haven't visited our website yet, well, take a minute to do that right now because that's where you're going to find interesting videos, blogs, our curated bookstore, and where you can register to get our monthly newsletter that has the complete guest schedule for the upcoming month. And you want to see who's coming up because we have some top guests from the Secretary General of NATO to folks like Alan Dershowitz. And you want to keep up on where this none of the above option is going to go. Maybe Dershowitz will pick that up and make that his next court case. Mark your calendars right now because our guest next week is the CEO of one of the biggest foundations in the world who has a plan for how America can take the it can develop the next thinkers, makers, and risk takers so the U.S. can win in the new knowledge economy. Jamie Marisotis will be here to discuss his game-changing book, America Needs Talent. That's Jamie Marisotis next week right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. Hi, I'm Rebecca Costa, and I want to tell you about a new sponsor of the Costa Report, Michael Zwirling, the founder of ZBS Radio Associates. Michael, or MZ as he's known, is a self-made millionaire who's operated KSCO AM 1080 in Santa Cruz, California for over 25 years. But what's truly fascinating is that MZ didn't make his fortune in radio or by working for others. He built his wealth by thinking outside the box, and now he wants to share his success with you to help you get out of the rut of working day after day just to pay your bills. In the coming months, you're going to hear tips on this program from MZ and people who have followed his advice. Pay close attention, keep an open mind, and then check out the videos and websites he recommends. There's still opportunity in the land of opportunity. Let MZ show you how easy it is to turn your financial situation around today and do it all on your own terms. Healthcare that fits your Santa Cruz lifestyle. That's why Dignity Health Dominican Hospital and Dignity Health Medical Group Dominican Work with you to make personal choices regarding your health. It's the type of care we can offer because we're more than just a hospital and medical group. We're part of this community. Visit DominicanHospital.org to find a doctor and start living healthy today. Health care that fits your Santa Cruz lifestyle. Dignity Health. Hello, human kindness. How many lawyers does it take to answer a legal question? In this case, the answer is two. Join my co-host, law professor Stephen Wagner and me, Mitchell Winnick, Dean of Monterey College of Law. Wagner and Winnick on the Law, Saturday afternoons, 4 to 5 p.m., here on KSCO AM 1080. Remember, 
If you don't know the law, know a lawyer. Serving Northern California for over 65 years. This is KSCO Santa Cruz.